global health epidemiologist and associate professor in the Faculty of Health Sciences at the University of Ottawa. Good morning to you. Good morning. You know, we were all scrambling for this vaccine two years ago, and now we see these low vaccination rates in kids. What's going on? I think there are several things going on. First is the flood of misinformation that we've all been subjected to. Things like the vaccine doesn't work anymore or it's uh, unduly dangerous or that uh, kids don't get the disease seriously enough to warrant vaccination. I think that's what's driving much of this. And it doesn't help that many public health figures in the past uh, few weeks in Canada have been downplaying the severity of the pandemic, pretending that it's over when it's not over. So I think the public rationally gets a, a bad message that the risk of the vaccine, which is minuscule, um, does not warrant um, combating the risk of the pandemic, which is still quite high for many people. But you, you see that vaccination rate among adults and teens on Prince Edward Island at 94%. How does that misinformation, uh, you know, it didn't affect that age group, but yet only 54% in children. Why the difference in kids? Well, first of all, the misinformation isn't targeted to the children, it's targeted to the parents. And understandably, parents are more skittish about what they put into their children's bodies than they are about what they put into their own bodies. Our tolerance for risk for our children is much, much lower. So the messaging, the, um, the signal of safety for children must be significantly more profound to, to change uh, to parents' minds appreciably. Um, I think what's really driving us a lot, though, is the sense that schools have always been safe, and they haven't always been safe. I think that's been a, a misunderstanding of some of the numbers. And I think um, many people have it in their minds that when children do get it, they have an easier ride, and they're less likely to be hospitalized and to die. And that's largely true, but given the um, hyper-contagiousness of Omicron, a large number of children are going to be exposed and infected. Therefore, it's totally warranted to get as much protection into that population as possible. Would it help if vaccines were rolled out in schools? I think it would, actually. I think it's time now to consider making COVID vaccination mandatory for schools. I did not support that a few months ago when I thought that kind of messaging would drive people away from the arms of public health. But I think we're at the point now where the safety signal for these vaccines is so profoundly good and the need to protect uh, or diminish transmission in schools is so high that making it mandatory would help and making it available in schools, not just for kids, but also for their parents who are not yet vaccinated would be useful, as we have done for vaccinations in the past. In, in many cases, vaccine uptake hinges on communication and on trust. What are the weaknesses that you are seeing in the messages? Ooh, that's a tough one. Um, I think the way we communicate effectiveness has been ineffective, ironically. People don't respond to numbers. They don't respond to graphs necessarily. They respond to relationships and narratives. Uh, we learn this with the messaging around the anti-smoking campaign, where you personalize it, you make it about you know your relationships and your path through life, not necessarily about this carries this much risk and that carries that much risk. That's, that's part of it. The other part of it is making... Uh, experts available uh, to have conversations. The hardcore anti-vaxxers I don't think will ever reach, but the vaccine hesitant just need some hand-holding and some time to answer their questions. Have they had that ability yet, uh, that opportunity? I'm not sure they have. So having uh, trusted uh, figures available to answer direct questions I think would be quite useful. It seems like public health officials have been widely available throughout this pandemic to the point where, you know, at some stages there were practically daily news conferences. That there needs to be even more availability? There are different kinds of availability. I mean, that kind of availability is good for journalists and for asking the broad questions. But what I find, I, I get so many emails from the average citizen every week who's asking specific questions about their circumstance, about clarity about a piece of information or misinformation that they saw online. That eats up a lot of my time. I'm not even a public health uh, figure. So to have someone or an agency or a facility available all the time to answer these kinds of questions at an individual personal level, I think would be useful. You said that people respond to narratives and, uh, rather than statistics. And in, in the news today, we hear of the case of a 22 year old in Halifax who's in a wheelchair. She has long COVID, too weak to walk whenever she leaves the house. Now, she's obviously older than the, the, the group that we're focusing on today. But what do stories like that do to the vaccination rate amongst kids? I'm not sure that particular story is going to move the needle much, and I feel badly for that person. We have to be careful. If we amplify those kinds of stories too much, we risk 
playing the fear card and being accused of being feared pornographers, you know, as I've been many times, um, that's a danger. But at the same time, at the other end, we have the anti-vaxxers playing all sorts of uh, fear cards about uh, these stories of adverse reactions and, and terrifying people against those. So amplifying tiny, tiny signals statistically uh, beyond the impact that they actually have in the population. So again, we, we have to balance or combat the fear misinformation from one camp with the appropriate misinformation from the proper public health camp. It sounds like you're walking a very fine line when you're trying to develop those messages to convince people. It's an emerging science and art, and in previous iterations of public health emergencies, we thought we knew what to do. Communication was about uh, identifying the crisis, um, alerting the public to the nature of the crisis and what we're doing about it and allowing them to understand what they need to do about it. We didn't anticipate having to combat so much dedicated misinformation and well-funded disinformation. It's like public health communicators are soldiers in an evolving war in many ways and we're not as well resourced or equipped um, to manage the battle as are the, the forces on the other side not to mention the endless personal attacks. So uh, it's a bit of an uphill ba battle, and I think the solution has to include widespread investment in underlying public science literacy. Uh, we will lose this unless that's done. Dr. Heather Morrison, our chief public health officer on Prince Edward Island, said that children getting COVID may be a factor in the lower vaccination rate here, because once you're diagnosed with COVID, you can't get the vaccine for three months. Do you think that that's part of what's behind the lower numbers? It might be part of it. I'm not convinced that's a significant part of it. I think that the people who wanted the vaccines probably got it earlier on before they got infected. Uh, there seems to be a bifurcation in society of those who, who are really, really pro-vaccine and those who are really, really anti-vaccine and not a lot of space in between. So if you are eager to get vaccinated in the first place or eager for your child to get vaccinated, you, you probably got them the jab um, before they got infected. So I'm not sure. I have no data to back up that supposition. In my experience, the hesitancy is so intense and profound that I think that's what's driving most of it nationally, um, possibly some of that uh, locally. So here we are at 54% uh, of kids vaccinated on PEI, 42% nationally. Where do you think we should be? What should the rate be? I think it should be as close to 100 as possible. Um, this is a very, very safe vaccine. Not perfectly safe, let's be honest here. Nothing is perfectly safe, but we, we certainly have the expertise now and the experience to be able to identify uh, to a large extent which, which kids should not be vaccinated and we have good treatment options for those few adverse reactions that do occur. Um, so given the profound safety and given the fact that vaccination effectiveness far outweighs that minuscule risk uh, and given that we're looking in, down the barrel of a potential seventh wave come September, the best way to keep uh, schools open is to keep our uh, mitigation tools in place and to probably make vaccination mandatory. So I think it should be as close to 100% as we can get. That uh, talk of a seventh wave sends a chill. You know, if those vaccination rates don't improve by the school year, you know, beginning in September, what, what do you think is going to happen? We'll probably see something um, similar to what we saw in the earlier part of this year. Not, not as serious, though. I think we have sufficient population immunity that the challenge to our healthcare system will not be as intense as it was in previous ways. But we will see things like um, uh, workers having to take time off from work, so staffing issues will continue. Um, the economic impact will still be felt but it won't be shutting society down and probably not shutting schools down, but it will be causing uh, some consternation and chaos in people's lives because of the rolling absences. Masks are off in schools. Should they be back on come September? My preference is that masks stay on so long as kids under five don't have a vaccination option. Anytime we have a significant portion of the demographic that cannot be protected, we have to do what we can to protect them in other ways. So until they can protect themselves, we do what we can to slow transmission rates into that, uh, that population. It was good to talk to you this morning. Thanks so much. It's my pleasure. Thank you. That was Raywat Dionandan. He is a global health 